Hey everyone, back again. Today we're going to talk about Chandra Mohanty's essay, Under Western Eyes. Now, I'm in a new space. I'm itinerant. I move around. Uh, if you're new here, welcome. I'm David. I try to explain philosophical concepts and ideas and ways to make them accessible to you. So if you're new, like, share, subscribe. You can go and see the more than 200 episodes I already have up, covering a whole array of different topics. If you found this in podcast form, you're going to be able to find the video of it on YouTube, if you're into that. Or if you found this on YouTube, you're going to be able to find it in podcast form if you just want the audio. If you want to help me out, do all those things I just mentioned, like, share, subscribe. You can help me out monetarily via Patreon or PayPal, but obviously no pressure to do that. If you are listening to this on a podcast platform, you can leave five stars, obviously, and that would help me out a lot. Tell your friends. Who knows? They might get a kick out of it. So yeah, let's cover this short essay to kind of continue on my post-colonialism stream of thought. Uh, and covering these these very important texts. And something to think about, I think, when contemplating post-colonialism is exactly what that term means. What does it mean to imply that colonization has ended, to be in the post phase of colonialism? Can such a thing occur if the effects are still being experienced by people all across the world because of decades, centuries of imperialism? Then how can it possibly be said that colonization ever finishes? So what then does that mean for a term like post-colonialism? Just food for thought. Now, I think that this essay, Chandra Mahanti's Under Western Eyes, is important for a number of reasons, in that it accentuates the necessity to complicate aggressors and victims under colonial regimes. And right off the bat, she stresses that the necessity for this complication is born out of the fact that colonization does exactly the opposite. Colonization performs, among other things, it performs one action really well, and that is to reduce colonized bodies, colonized people, to a homogenous single group that can be easily controlled, maintained, managed, placed under colonial rule. So she, in this essay, is trying to think through that and to imagine a possibility of combating colonialism without simply replicating the same homogenizing trends that colonization and colonialism use so fruitfully. Now her specific interest for this short essay is the idea, the notion, the image of the third world woman as a homogenous category from the perspective of Western feminists, so that she herself does not commit the same kind of homogenization as she is trying to criticize. She does not suggest that there is a homogenous, monolithic Western feminism that is participating in this homogenization of third world women. Rather, her interest is in the way that Western discourses, specifically Western discourses that adopt a rhetoric of liberation, that is trying to free people in the so-called third world, trying to liberate people in the so-called third world, how all of these discourses rely upon some consistent threads, and they really are brought together via these threads. So some of the consistent themes, and if anyone's listened to the episodes I've just done on Edward Said's Orientalism, you'll know that there are some consistent themes that run through many Orientalist projects in an Orient orientalist ideas. Some of these include the idea that the West is best. It is just superior to the East. And this is imbued, and the West is imbued with a number of qualities as a result, as being more scientifically proficient, more politically proficient, more technologically proficient, which all contribute in a repeated reduction, in a repeated homogenization over the third world as being less advanced than the so-called West. Now, in the case of Western feminism, what it does, and on its face this isn't necessarily a bad thing, it becomes one, is that it filters its understanding of oppression, in this case patriarchal oppression, uses that understanding and applies it to the rest of the world, as though patriarchy functions the same in Bangladesh as it might in upstate New York, which is, you know, when you put it in terms like that, it's just totally absurd. Or in Pakistan versus Los Angeles, you know, just two, you know, in themselves, just two very broad 
uh, different regions. But more importantly than the naive assumption that their understanding of patriarchy and of gender-based oppression can just be applied anywhere else, on top of that, all of their rhetoric of trying to free or to liberate the third world woman ignores the fact that the West, specifically Europe, has participated and has conducted so many colonial expeditions and regimes, massive swaths of land placed under colonial rule, under European colonial rule. So by ignoring this fact, Western feminist discourse, instead of actually helping women in these places, contribute to a similar act of reducing these women and speaking for them instead of letting them speak and listening to them and their specific needs. So Western feminists ignore the real lived experiences of regional women all across the world. And I think that this certainly could be applied to women's experience even within the United States. Differently situated women are going to have vastly different experiences of oppression, especially when you're going to consider their uh, socioeconomic status, sexual orientation, their own gender identity, or any kind of womanhood that exists along a spectrum or outside of that spectrum. You're going to have vastly different experiences of oppression. Now, she extends this to men as well, to say that men is not in itself, in her words, a coherent group that can just be identified as the perpetrators of patriarchal oppression. She suggests that certainly uh, we, we can't ignore the fact that men are 95% of the time the culprits of gender-based violence, but it's important to acknowledge the different ways that patriarchy operates in different settings. Men are going to benefit in different ways. The very category of manhood is going to be placed under relief. It's going to be questioned in different settings. Who gets qualified as a man? That is, who can actually participate in the same kind of patriarchal foundational assumptions in any given place is going to be contingent on specific regional codes, understandings as to who can qualify as a man, who can participate in the oppression of others, who is going to be just forbidden from participating in these, uh, these really heinous acts, and so on. So her goal is to complicate both this idea of man and woman to understand in, in as precise a way as possible and this comes through by listening to people, listening to women in different places all across the world to learn exactly what they need, what they are experiencing, and how to best remedy any oppression that they are experiencing and how to bring men into the fold so that they don't contribute, they don't repeat the same cycles of violence. Now, Western feminism isn't just violent in its erasure of the complexities of third world women they are also participate in just flat out oppression themselves in associating third world woman, women with various negative uh, connotations, associating them with various negative attributes, including being like less developed or being more tied tra to tradition as compared to the so-called free liberal woman in the so-called first world who can do what she wants with her body, who can work wherever she wants, and they associate the third world woman as being bound, bound by a number of believed to be archaic ways of existing in the world. So these stereotypical assumptions and beliefs about third world women then come to replace the actual lived embodied experiences of these women. And then all that happens is that Western feminists, any that try to help, will just try to have their vision of the third world, again in air quotes, the third world, confirmed. And what that will do is repeat the same cycles of violence that have been inflicted likely across centuries. She concludes this essay by saying that it must be theorized, or male violence must be theorized and interpreted within specific societies, so that it isn't as though there's just one single way to understand male violence and its effects on women, but to really complicate and extend these discussions to many different people to get as large a possible grasp or as precise a grasp of these issues in specific places. And yeah, that's essentially her essay. If there's anything I excluded that you think would be important to add or anything I 
misinterpreted or mis uh, presented, I'd love to hear about it. If you like what I did, like, share, subscribe. Yeah, catch you next time. Take care.